Hey, y'all. Welcome back to my channel. I'm Leslie Hooper. And I'm Steph Miramontes. Today, we're going to be reacting to a recent Lane Norton interview hosted by Stephen Bartlett. And this is an interesting one, Steph. So keep your eyes and ears open as we dive into this topic that I think you'll appreciate. People who are obese tend to have a greater reward response from food, whereas people who are lean or normal weight, it's it's not like that huge reward that they get. It's like some people, you know, they they can they can have a drink, they can have a beer. And they go, I like the beer, you know. And other people become alcoholics, mm -hmm. right? And so so much of this stuff gets tied up in it gets wired in as a as a kind of coping mechanism. If you look at like for example binge eating, what's happening during a binge is that person is getting a flood of dopamine, right? They're, they're, they're masking, they want to mask that feeling of whatever made them feel uncomfortable. I always tell people, I'm like, you don't really find people binge eating after they've had eight hours of sleep at 10 a.m. in the morning when they're low stress, right? It's at 10 p.m. at night after a long day, they've been fighting with their spouse, their kids are driving them nuts, and they just, they want to turn it all off, right? And I think staying mindful is one of the hardest things we have as humans. I mean, I know what my addiction is, unfortunately, based on my um, current job, I get way too into social media. You know, I just end up, you know, it kind of started as well, I'm, I'm doing work, right? And I'm responding to comments and all that. Sort of, and pretty soon, I'm looking at my screen time, and I'm going, Oh, my gosh, right. And so that was something for me to numb up and turn my mind off, right? But for other people, it's food. For other people, it's gambling. For other people, it's alcohol. For other people, it's some other drug. So what do we do with that then? So if, how, do we first have to figure out what our relationship is on a psychological level with these addictions, with, with our food, for example? If we're just focusing on weight loss to start with, when you, if you were to be coaching someone, would you try and understand their um, propensity to binge, to, to have that sort of you know, like dopamine craving or, or do you focus somewhere else? I kind of say, all right, like, walk me through a, a typical day for you. Walk me through a typical week. Where, where's, where are your struggles really at, right? You have to have two things that are critically important. Accountability with empathy. Because if you're just the accountability coach, the drill sergeant who's, you know, most people, if they screw up, they've beat themselves up more than anybody else. I know I'm that way. I'm sure you're that yeah. way. I'm going to stop here for just a moment because I did hire an online coach who works with the same demographic as Dr. Lane Norton here. And it was a bodybuilding community. So I was doing macro counting and I do appreciate the empathy plus accountability conversation because that was the one thing that was missing for me was empathy or any curiosity would have been helpful asking me anything about my history or my current challenges. There was really none of that. Every week I just got some new macros thrown at me after sending some progress pictures and that was about the extent of it. And so I just wanted to get your impression or thoughts on this so far. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, in our programs, we call it compassionate accountability. We talk about accountability from us as coaches, accountability from yourself. And most people are holding themselves accountable in the worst possible way that just makes them want to run away from any form of conversation. When we bring in the skill of self-compassion, all of a sudden the conversation becomes much more helpful and productive and making the next best decision becomes so much easier than when we're wasting our time being hypercritical of things that are fixable. So I do like that conversation. And I think it's probably missing in most sort of hardcore coaching worlds, for lack of a better descriptor. It's just kind of like suck it up, buttercup. You're not playing for funsies here. You're If you're playing to win when it comes in the bodybuilding competitions and things of that nature, there is a certain personality that tends to thrive there and that personality type also tends to often become a coach to that personality and it just comes becomes this kind of 
um, it's, it's a little messy circle that we often see. I definitely agree with Lane. We do need to have compassionate or in his case, empathetic accountability if we want our clients to excel. And that is a skill in and of itself, I will say, as a coach. So, so if you're just beating somebody up, if you're just holding them accountable without empathy, you just become the drill sergeant. And what happens is people end up tuning you out or they're not honest with you anymore because they don't want to constantly feel like they're failing, right? The empathy portion, if you just have empathy and you're saying, I'm so sorry that happened, that's so hard, I understand, but you're not holding them accountable, there's no impetus for change, right? So it takes, it takes both. Mm -hmm. And so the way I'd often coach, like let's take a, somebody had a binge, something like that. The first thing I'd say, I understand why it happened. You know, that's really hard. Where, what was the antecedent to this? Like what, what started this, right? Okay, now let's look at, if we had to go back and do it over again, what are some things we might be able to do to put some, to put some barriers, right? So I had, I had one client, he's a, a hedge fund manager. And when he started with me, he was binging pretty much, I would say almost every day. And I said, okay, where do you find that this is happening? And he said, well, usually it's after everybody's gone to bed and, you know, um, I just find myself in the kitchen and it just happens. So, okay. So it's not reasonable to lock yourself in your room, right? But what if we just did a few things to increase your mindfulness, right? Put a post on the cabinet where you where you keep that the junk food, right? Not saying anything nasty or anything, but I just said, write down, am I hungry or am I just upset? Then on your on your door, right? Lock it from the inside. It's not, you know, it doesn't keep you from going out, but you have to unlock it, right? Like you're having to turn your brain on, right? And it the more barriers you can put there, the the better it gets. The more sort of mindful moments you can have where you make you have to kind of make a decision and you don't you come out of autopilot because i yeah. notice when whenever i have my binge moments which happens once in a while it is like unthinking yeah it's just like a robot has taken over okay i'm going to stop right here <laughs> i agree with the mindfulness 100 percent, and getting those speed bumps if you will in place to help people bring awareness to their conscious what well what is subconscious bring it conscious so they can make a different decision. And binge eating is a habit. So when those wheels are in motion, being able to pause and make a different decision is a total game changer. I'm not really sure what door he was talking about locking from the inside. I'm like, are we, we're not talking about like pantry. What door are we locking? Because I would have some big problems with that recommendation if that's where we were going with that. That's what stood out to me too. I'm like, wait, what are we locking? Hold on. Wait, wait, what a sec. Wait, what? <laughs> I do like the sticky note. I like anything that can help you bring some awareness. Here's what I know about sticky notes though. The first time you ignore that sticky note, it becomes part of the wall. It is no longer a sticky note. It does not exist. Your brain won't ever see it again. It loses its importance. Your brain filters it out. No problem. So sometimes when clients struggle with overeating and snacking and things, I'll suggest, hey, why don't you just rearrange your pantry a little just to shock your brain? Like usually you just go and grab the box of cereal and start eating handfuls out of it. Why don't you put the cereal on a different shelf, not out of your reach, just to make your brain look for it, it slows down the process, kind of like James Clear talks about putting his beer in the back of the fridge. It just slows down the process enough to make you a decider. But that's not what binge eating is. That's not binge eating. That's just habitual overeating, snacking, compulsive eating, things like that. Binge eating comes from restriction. And so we can slow all this down. You know, often we talk about binge better, binge somewhere else. If you're going to binge, like, do you have your binge chair? Binge in a different chair. See if it slows you down and wakes you up a little bit. You know, those things can be helpful as like tactics, strategies, but only if we first eliminated the restriction, even if we're, we first have to eliminate the restriction of foods and the mental and emotional restriction of life saying, I'm not good enough for this, or I can't do this because I actually don't agree that people don't binge in the mornings. I think as soon as someone tells themselves they're going to be better tomorrow, back on track in the morning, and they make one little error, 
one too many bites of something or the cookies are sitting there and they just have one, as soon as the spiral starts, it is going because it's that all or nothing thinking, that restriction thinking of I'm good or I'm bad that really triggers binge eating, not locking cabinets for me in my, from my experience and perspective. For sure. The reality is when it comes to the behavior of binge eating, your best to get ahead of it by looking at what you ate the previous week. That's what sets the wheels in motion, isn't what just happened in that singular moment in time. It's the accumulation of the meals and feeling restricted and deprived that get you to that breaking point. And look, I've talked about it many times. This used to be a big challenge of my own. And it was rooted in all or nothing thinking, as you indicated, Steph, kind of that willpower battery has drained because we've been fighting and white knuckling our way around these foods that we're supposed to be avoiding. And we're not getting a whole lot of uh, pleasure in the same way from our meals, because generally it's a lot of the same food. So there's not a lot of variety. There's not a lot of um, spontaneity there or anything. It's pretty militant this is what you're going to eat. And this is the amount that you're going to eat it in. And that for a binge eater is the recipe, the foundation that starts to build those feelings of scarcity. Also humans don't like to feel controlled or have our independence and freedom taken away. And being tied to my fitness pal, some people can handle it. No problem. But a lot of people can't, we don't know anything about this particular client, but if he's anything like my former self or clients that I've worked with, if he's macro counting, that's not going to be particularly helpful for a binge eater. I mean, this is how you create a binge eater. This isn't how you help one heal. I think it's interesting because it seems like some people are more prone to eat their face off than others because of the high reward levels. And I actually agree with that. I think that there are higher reward levels in some people's brains than others. We create associations like there are people out there actually that exist that are just like, I don't even like chocolate or I don't, I don't like any sweets at all. And then there are other people that feel like that is their literal addiction and can't see a way through. And so that's pretty clear that it's not the food itself that is the, <laughs> the problem here, but how we're thinking about it and how we're feeling rewarded by it because you can also change that. I've experienced that myself where I felt like these foods were so important and I loved them so much and they were so good and so hard to say no to. And then over time, I'm just like, oh, you know how long it's been since I've even had one of those? Doesn't even taste good anymore. So those things can change based on you and your change. But locking things away, telling yourself, I can't, that immediately says, I can't be trusted. I, these foods are dangerous and I can't be trusted. I need to create enough barriers between me and them that hopefully it'll stop me because I need to be stopped. That, as you said, creates the binge eater, doesn't heal the binge eater. Well, it's no. disempowering. We're just locking things up as opposed to understanding where is this strong emotional drive coming from in the first place? what is triggering the binge and trying to peel back the layers and understand the mental framework that's creating the, such a strong desire in the first place. And like I said, it, usually it comes from years of dieting. And the reality is most binge eaters that we work with tend to be long-term dieters who have a history of pretty extreme dieting. So I imagine there's a pattern, there's a history here uh, to get to this point because you don't just wake up one day and be a binge eater. It's a process. So I would love to have a conversation with this client and uh, try to help them out because this is where I feel like we do some of our best work. But I have a lot of compassion and empathy because it's so maddening to be stuck in that cycle and not understand it or the path on how to break out of it. And it's really scary because the first step is literally working through the foods that you fear. And that's the opposite of what you want to do because you feel like those are the foods that are responsible or going to contribute to your weight gain. And that is the, for a dieter, that is the worst, most uncomfortable 
position that they can possibly be in, but it is the first step is confronting the foods you fear and learning to overcome that restriction by adopting an abundance mindset. Steph, I'm not going to show the rest because they're switching gears in their conversation, but anything else you wanted to add here? Just briefly, what I was getting to with the dopamine thing is we can put all the barriers in place to eating the food that we want to, but then what? Because if your only option is bend your face off or sit on your hands and on in the middle of your living room floor, miserable and like an itch that you can't scratch, we're not solving anything. It's maybe confidence building. It shows you that you can do it, which is great, but willpower can only be relied on for so long. What is at the root of the problem? What is the need that food is meeting for us? If we've eliminated the restriction, if we've eliminated the super strict diet rules and all of this is still lingering, we need to figure out what the need is underneath that so that we can meet it. So we're not just using willpower until we break again, because that's dieting. That's all dieting is. Yeah. Okay, y'all. Well, thanks for joining us today. If you found this video helpful and want to get notified for our future videos, be sure to hit the subscribe and notifications bell on your way out. Have a good one.